This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 98 are husband and wife Jungian analysts, John and Nada O'Brien in Belgrade, Serbia. Nada holds a master's degree in semiology and a doctorate in music pedagogy from the University of Arts in Belgrade, and earned a diploma in analytical psychology from the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich. In addition to her practice as a Jungian analyst, she works as a university lecturer and as a consultant. She has spent more than 20 years working with leaders and groups across a wide scope of industries, including the Nordic Council of Ministers, the Norwegian National Health Service, and leading global financial services organizations in the UK, Europe, and the United States using a Jungian approach. Dr. O'Brien lectures on music and the unconscious, and, together with her husband John, on Jung's word association experiment. She has been leading international dream groups for 15 years and is a published author and researcher in the fields of analytical psychology, infant research, leadership, football, and music. Her article, Who is Listening? A Psychoanalytic View on Listening Phenomena, was published in the journal New Sound in 2018, and her scientific paper, Universal Organizing Principles of Music and Fairy Tales, was published in the Musicology Journal of the Academy of Science and Arts in Belgrade. John holds a master's degree in psychology therapy and counseling from Antioch University's Regents College in London and a Master of Business Administration from the University of Brighton. He later trained as a Jungian analyst, earning a diploma in analytical psychology from the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich where he has presented seminal workshops on Jungian coaching. His early career was in education guidance and social work in London, where he worked as a principal officer for children and families. After becoming a registered psychotherapist, he went on to lead therapeutic practice at a community home with education, where he worked with Tom Pitt Aikens, a British psychiatrist and Jungian analyst, pioneering Jungian and institutional family work. Having completed an MBA, John also led a firm providing pioneering depth psychology consulting and coaching services to major corporations and institutions in the UK, the US, and Europe. In addition to practicing as a Jungian analyst, he is independently contributing to international and multidisciplinary Jungian scientific research and applications of Jung's work beyond the consulting room and into diverse domains. He has been working with colleagues and partners to bring analytical psychology in new ways to individuals and organizations, including addressing collective trauma via Jungian sports and health psychology research. Presently, he is an elected member of the C.G. Jung Institute Kusnacht English Research Group, a fellow of the Institute of Coaching at McLean Harvard Medical School affiliate, and a member of the C.G. Jung Institute of Dallas. Together, John and Nada teach the mandatory seminar Introduction into the Word Association Test to training candidates at the Jung Institute in Zurich and are editors of the books Analytical Psychology of Football and The Professional Practice of Jungian Coaching, both published by Routledge. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, December 8th, 2021, through the magic of Skype. John, Nada, hi. Hi. I'd like to start with you, Nada. Uh, If you would tell us briefly your path to becoming a Jungian analyst. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, Well, my first memories were musical, and I always um, comprehended the world through music medium somehow. And uh, I oriented since very early age through my dreams. And I always um, found the intuitive link between the two. 
And then uh, when I went on with my music education at the university, I had the first lecture, age 18, about symmetry. And somehow uh, that it was actually music analysis. And somehow that image, symmetry, it was an image to me, mm-hmm. deep image. Immediately, I got through my intuitive function, the, the connection to dreams. And I said, that's it. That, that is my path. Mm-hmm. And then I went on when I lived in Norway. Um, I had a dream when I was very early. I was um, in my analysis. And um, I had a dream of coming to Jung's Institute in Kirsnacht. Mm-hmm. And then later on, through many different synchronicities uh, and following the, the inner guide, I ended up at um, Jung's Institute. And that is where I met John, actually, my very first year. Ah, oh, that's where you two met. And John, how about you? How did you become a Jungian analyst after your long career? Um, I think the uh, beginning of becoming a, a Jungian analyst was uh, when I was a very young child and my first remembered a bedtime story by my father uh, when he told me a little story and at the end of it he said, what does mean mean? What does mean mean? And this question puzzled me for about 40, 50 60 and now nearly 70 years oh and became quite an inspiration uh, in drawing me forward through various experiences uh, to the C.G. Jung Institute in Kuznacht, where we discussed and discovered and experienced to some extent in various ways and from different paths the central archetype of meaning, the mm-hmm. experience of the self. Mm-hmm. It's a long journey. (laughs) A a very long journey. And you both graduated from the Institute at the same time. Is that right? Yeah. We did. Uh, We spoke that together, not just then. That was nice. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) So were you both living in in Kusnacht or in the Zurich area the entire time you were training? No, we, we traveled three times per year, I think, if not even uh, more frequent. From where you were living, you traveled to Zurich to complete the training. Yes. And yes. how long For did that six, take? Six years, six years, I think. Maybe a bit longer to, uh, for John. Yeah, I started a little bit earlier. It was seven years. Uh, uh, Nada was living mainly in Norway, and I was living mainly in London. And how did you both wind up in Serbia? Uh, we, um, um, first we, <laughs> you, you go, John, please. We wound up in Serbia um, uh, via um, an invitation to a Chelsea football match in London, which I gave to Nada. That is his version, Laura. Okay, I I, I understand. We'll get yours <laughs> after. Okay, John, continue. <laughs> Um, uh, which was really our first kind of uh, um, major date uh, together. Um, And um, getting to know each other, uh, I was sharing some of my love for football with Nada. Nada was sharing her great love and passion for music uh, with me. Uh, And on the basis of uh, mutual curiosity and interest, uh, Nada came to London to watch Chelsea play, and I came to Belgrade uh, to listen to the music and to discover this wonderful, wonderful, um, rich culture of history and cultural background of Balkans music. And um, we, um, that's, so that's really how we got together, really, I guess. And Nada, your Jung version? Was the common denominator. Jung was the common denominator. <laughs> Jung was the yeah, common Jung denominator. Jung was the common denominator, definitely, definitely, because uh, the very first date we had in Kersnacht was actually the big match. Was it a football World Football Cup or something? And then uh, John invited me, and I said, oh, this time would suit me. Thank you very much for your invitation. And he said, oops, I really can't manage because I have to follow this match. So I said, well, 
that's a bit indicative. And, uh, but I succumbed to meet him and then we continued our conversation. But I think my version would be much longer and maybe not that amusing for John. So <laughs> I ah. am very happy to leave it at his, his, uh, his way. Okay, we'll leave it right there. We'll leave it right there. Mm. So <laughs> I just want to clear up one term. When you mention football, you mean what we call here in the United States soccer? Is that right? Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, that's that, that is correct. Yeah. The title of your book is "Analytical Psychology of Football: Professional Jungian Football Coaching." So the word "football" appears twice. You are referring to what we call here in the United States soccer, but my question is: Does it also apply to American football? Yes, yeah, both both are true. Um, I think maybe one of the reasons that the word football is used twice is because it applies both to England and the United States in different ways. So let's get into the book. I'd like to hear the background as to how this came to be, because my interest, I've been a lifelong NFL, which is the National Football League, Uh, here in the United States, American football, again, I've been a lifelong fan of the NFL through my father, who was a big football fan, and he played college football. And I've been watching football my whole life. And then I uh, became involved with it in a very personal way. I've been to, oh, I don't know, close to 100 NFL football games, I continue to watch it to this day, so I'm very familiar with American football, but I'm not as familiar with soccer. So when I saw your book, and was it published in 2021 by Routledge? Uh, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it was three years in the making, right? Yes. Yeah, the research started uh, three years ago, and we started our um, write-ups about 12 months ago. My first question is, what prompted two Jungian analysts from very different backgrounds? I mean, uh, Nada, your background is in music, and John, uh, you have an MBA, and now you're both Jungian analysts, and then you started researching football. That is fascinating to me. When I saw this book, I was stunned. I still couldn't believe it because I have been trying to apply Jungian psychology to football for, oh, since the year 2000. Shall I go first, John and Laura? Sure. 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 Well, as we said, I mean, it's not just uh, for the uh, amusement's sake. It's actually a fascinating fact that from our very first encounter, football was a constellated theme in our field, in John's and my field. So um, interestingly enough, uh, soon after our um, dating, I would say, we were blessed with a child. And um, we were joking all the way because one of the very strong strong experience, uh, experiences of English culture is football, of course. It's unavoidable and it's quite overwhelming. And um, uh, we actually met when I came from Norway to to England, actually on Chelsea uh, match versus Arsenal. I remember it very well because the opposites were constellated to the extreme in intensity. And I was, uh, it was my very first experience of the uh, archetypal, I would say, because it's in England, football match, soccer, soccer match. And what was remarkable for me, because I was very sort of, innocent and naive, very open, that's Mm -hmm. what I mean by saying so, very open, without any prejudices, uh, just open and curious, was that I experienced uh, this ritual of football for 90 plus minutes uh, in the terms of a music script. So all these Mm -hmm. energies constellated going between the two poles and incredible, incredible uh, phenomenon of creating football songs impromptu there on the spot, Mm. which anticipated the movement on the pitch. And I was shocked to experience that. And I was thinking it's all about the movement of energies. It's about Mm. this multidimensional libidinal flow that Jung is writing about in his energy perspective. 
And I was thinking that it must be a stage for a play or replay of how actually our psyche works, to put it very um, in a simplified way. It yeah. must be that there are two oppositional sources, opposites constellated, and then we work. It's, it's an attempt for the energy transformation process but it's collective, it's cultural, it's collective, maybe it's related to Thai guys, who knows? And it was absolutely remarkable. So I had my profound music experience in that event, and it never left me since. And then our son, who started being indoctrinated by John, of course, uh, by football, he, he has immense love of football and violin, and that's very interesting. And... Um, then it became very personal, of course, and I was astonished that a ball, be it football or any other ball, can attract so much libidinal force, mana, literally, and uh, attract millions and millions of people where nothing else matters. And then we had dreams, especially me and uh, synchronicities. And one thing after another, we were sort of guided. It took form in this process of writing the book, which was absolutely, um, we were humbled by these synchronicities, which we would like to believe accompanied us to support us in this process. Mm. So that's, that's my story. Okay. And John? Is the question what attracted us both to football? Uh, the question is, Nada's background was music, your background was business and coaching. You both became Jungian analysts. And then shortly after that, you started this research on football. And I found it unusual that Jungian analysts were looking at football. And John, oh. you and I uh, spoke on the phone, actually, it was a few yeah. months ago now. Yeah. And you made some connections that I had never made consciously, that I probably did unconsciously. You said football is a symbol of the clash of opposites and the tension of opposites on a social scale. Yeah. Oh, another quote I just want to mention before I let you jump in is you quoted George Orwell on the phone to me. You said, he, that George Orwell said football is war minus the shooting. Yeah. Yeah, I think all that is very, uh, very relevant. Um, you see, as a, um, as a child uh, growing up in London, football was a very, very curious, uh, interesting um, and puzzling experience. Um, it was not long after the war, maybe 10 years uh, less, seven years after the ending of the um, Second World War, um, when football really took off in London and, uh, and England you know, on a really, really, really big scale because mm -hmm. people had been deprived of this during the war. And the, um, I had no idea what all that was about at that time, but I came to realize um, that on the one hand, there was something very cathartic going on, that there was a healing of sorts going on when crowds went to a football match. At the same time, there was a huge clash of opposites and a uh, uh, violence being um, reenacted between supporters on the street and on the pitch. So much so that I, um, as it got worse towards the 70s, I just did not go to football for about 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the grounds in the game were then uh, reclaimed by setting firm and clear boundaries around crowd control, as well as reinforcing the rules. And I think it was at that point that I realized that this was a kind of a transformation process going on. And when I got to the Institute, it really came home that there was a transformation process going on. Something was being 
reenacted. Something was being played out. I emphasize the word play within um, secure boundaries. Mm -hmm. And if those secure boundaries were held and the tension of opposites was held, something very good transpired. So there were very good things that transpired. What are these good things? We had um, uh, uh, Didier Drogba um, stopping the Ivory Coast War by uh, uniting the uh, football teams and going down on his knees uh, in front of the camera and talking to the public and um, appealing to both sides of the conflict to lay down their weapons and to unite as one nation. And this was incredible. Mm -hmm. So if, if we think of symbols um, that represent both a divided society or division in society and conflict in society, which arises from unresolved trauma through the great conflicts and the great wars that people have experienced, mm -hmm. then you couldn't want a better symbol than football of people lining up in different coloured shirts on different sides of the pitch and, um, and playing together. And the play has both these elements, you see. So George Orwell was shortly after the end of the Second World War um, uh, wrote this wonderful uh, opinion of football, which was that um, it's really just a repetition of violence and war minus the shooting and doesn't add any value to anybody at all. And um, if you, if, for those of us who lived through those years of uh, football spectator violence, that's partly true. Yet, at the same time, the opposite is true. Mm -hmm. That there is something going on in that tension of opposites, which is of a kind of a prima materia nature. Um, and the football stadium offers um, a kind of a, 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 a crucible for these forces, these energies, to be um, symbolically played out and dramatized. Um, it has a cathartic element. Um, and um, it has a transformational element. The book consists of 11 contributors. John and Nada are the editors, and they've both contributed uh, chapters themselves. John, you wrote the chapters, What is Football? Football as a Force for Transformation, The Transcendent Function, and Putting it into Practice. And Nada wrote the chapters, Analytical Psychology of Football, Who is Playing, and Diagnostic and Practice Methods, Guardians of Play. Then the appendix includes a research study. But I would like for you to tell us, uh, either one of you, about the contributors, uh, the, the other nine people. Perhaps we could take that in turns, Nada, huh? No, maybe maybe you do it because of the book. You have the book in front of you. <clears throat> uh, okay, okay. So um, the the first contributor um, is the man who inspired us with this incredible football camp for children from all parts of the world, which is run in uh, the Serbian mountains every summer and uh, and often on in Chicago. And his name is uh, Dejan Stankovic, he's known as Deki, Deki Stankovic, who's a very famous football player, who's the only one, the only player who has played uh, in three World Cups for three different countries, which gives you some indication of his feeling, understanding of uh, the conflicts um, which have occurred in this region um, and his sense of the deeper nature of football and its importance in terms of creating safe space and play for children. And his motto is smile, one word, smile. That children in football training should 
a smile and be happy. And he's applied this both to, um, if you like, to, to two things. One, to um, the, the uh, training in one mountain uh, place, uh, and in another one called uh, Divchibara, uh, which is a recent development working with children with disabilities. And there's some very moving stories from there, which I will skip at the moment because I'm just mentioning um, the names. Uh, he was very much supported by Marco Nikolovsky, who's the camp director who we were working with and who was a, a wonderful partner in the research, a good representation, good authority in play. So the other contributors, briefly, um, uh, Professor Dr. Jaco Trebyeshanin. Jaco Trebyeshanin. He's an expert in psychological research, university professor, renowned OSCE expert, psychoanalytic focus, um, a great union, and um, he's written more than uh, 100 scientific articles and uh, many books. Um, his nickname when he was younger, uh, he's, I think he's in his 70s now, um, his nickname when he was a teenager was George Best. Uh, he used to play football <laughs> as a child, and that was his nickname. Um, Mike Roberts uh, is professional media writer for FC Barcelona. Uh, very good and popular, down-to-earth, no-nonsense football historian, who recent publications include a wonderful book called uh, The Same Old Game and uh, An Account of Football in Barcelona's comes from Christchurch University, Canterbury, now lives in Spain. On the US side, we have um, uh, Scott Pilkey, who has a, a lifetime of experience in coaching, mentoring young athletes. And for five years, he was the head football coach at Erie Community College. And he has brought an integrated methodology to the training of football in a US context. He calls it you bring chiropractics. And that is based on um, the relationship between the coach and the athlete. It's not a cookie cutter approach. It recognizes the soul, the spirit, the personal um, personality, the individual motivation of the child and um, of which he sees the coach as um, a, a servant to serve that relationship and to help bring out the potential in children. And that seems to us really, really uh, wonderfully connected with Decky's approach, that you have people from different cultures, different games, with the same name, football, um, really valuing and understanding the nurturing uh, and development of children, often who've come from uh, all sorts of backgrounds, but all who've come from cultures with a history of warfare, either recent or past, which is, in our opinion, reenacted on the football pitch to some extent. Pete Lowe um, was the head of education and performance management for um, a football club in England called Manchester City Football Club. He was there for 13 years. Um, he wrote The Language of Winning, and um, uh, he's, he's, uh, has achieved outstanding results. And when he left, he set up um, a counselling service and a helpline service for athletes who were suffering abuse in the dark side of um, uh, sports training. He's a good guy. Um, Clifford Mays is the founder of Archetypal Psychology. He's an American. He's a leading union scholar. Uh, he developed analytical psychology as an alternative or a complement as well to social science models. Comes from the University of Utah. He's a doctor of psychology from uh, Southern California University for Professional Studies. He's written 12 books, many articles, and he's probably the world leader in um, archetypal psychology of um, education, archetypal psychology of education. Then we have um, our good friend Michael Escamilla, who, who trained with us at the Institute, who not only has a wonderful sense of humour, 
but is a professor of psychiatry and department chair at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, in Edinburgh, Texas. He's a, a, a renowned psychiatrist. Um, uh, he's contributed to a, a number of um, institutes and projects. He was the founding director of the Center of Excellence in Neurosciences at Texas Tech University in El Paso. Um, he is an expert on um, the word association test uh, and on schizophrenia. He's a wonderful musician and uh, in his full life was a great um, American um, football fan. So he's one of these people who brings together football and music. Dr. Escamilla will be joining me next week for episode 99. Oh, oh that's great. I'll be sure to tune into that. Well, what is, what is he presenting on? We're going to be talking about his book on Jung and Bloiler and schizophrenia. So, but with, with all these episodes, we talk about a lot of things. So I'm going to ask him about uh, his chapter in your book as well. Yeah, he's, he's great. He's, he's really very, very, um, has a wonderful uh, human and expert attitude to schizophrenia. It was a great inspiration to us at the Institute as a colleague, as well as a, as an expert. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Dave Dave Burston um, is a, a Brit who lives in Los Angeles. Um, he was a, a, an actor who um, became a licensed psychotherapist, did his PhD in depth clinical psychology at Pacifica Grad Institute in Carpinteria, California, back in 2013. And um, he has he became very, very interested in all sports and has actually been consulting to Tottenham Hotspur uh, Football Club mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom, where he is really doing a great job um, helping young people um, understand the benefits of cooperation, of teamwork, of social development, um, of their role in sport, um, as well as the uh, competitive side of the sport. Um, and he, I, I've just been informed that he has a new contract with them, which they've extended to allow him to be in England um, for longer periods of time. So um, union work is finding its way into a number of different uh, different spheres. Yes. Um, which are wonderful, you know, mm -hmm. very diverse mm -hmm. spheres. Um, and Bill, Bill Beswick, is known as the father of um, uh, British sports psychology, we were very pleased to have his contribution, a wonderful contribution. He's worked with Manchester United, uh, FC20. He worked over with uh, men and women's teams in the United States. Um, he won, or his team, I should say, that he coached, won um, a gold medal uh, in um, uh, swimming in the UK. Um, and he has a wonderful book focused for soccer. It's also supported by one goal um, and the mindsets of winning, winning teams. And most uh, football clubs or soccer clubs have this Focus for Soccer book around. It's great. I've read it. It's hugely practical, very inspirational, no Jungian language in it at all, but completely Jungian in its essence, mm. which is wonderful. And he... Uh, he helped out um, uh, Methodist organizations in the U.S. Um, he was inspired by his early experiences in the U.K. As, um, as a young man who was introduced to sport and kept on the straight and narrow. Uh, a real down-to-earth, practical, well-respected um, sportsman with international experience. Um, I, I think he works with human kinetics in the U.S. at the moment. So there, uh, and then there's um, uh, uh, my uh, beautiful and uh, honourable wife Nada, of course, and um, and me. So that added up to I think eleven, eleven contributors, which I only discovered last week after we spoke a little bit longer yeah. about this about this uh, episode and synchronicity. Mm -hmm. I guess you must be the referee. <laughs> That's my role. That's my role. And mm. Nada, did you want to say anything about the contributors? 
it it was very meaningful so so uh, these uh, renowned colleagues came in a very uh, spontaneous and organic way and emerged for this process so i think that we are very grateful that we were surrounded and supported by um, these contributions which are really really valuable and this book is part of the Routledge Psychology of Sport, Exercise, and Physical Activity series. And John, as you were speaking, I noticed that you used the word warfare quite a bit. And I'd like to bring up the topic of violence, at least here in the United States with American football, that has been a very hot topic. The number of concussions that have been experienced by the players, but you had mentioned to me that it is not scientifically correct that football leads to violence. You see it as a civilizing force. I'm wondering if either of you would like to say something about that, about the issue of violence. Should I take that topic, Madam? Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, it's a it's deeply interesting um, topic and question and a critical one. Um, when we looked very closely at the research, which is um, detailed in the uh, in the book, um, it appears that um, the bottom line is that football um, is per se neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a contained sport, and left to its own devices. Uh, without undue influence, um, it, it is um, healing, it brings people together, uh, children enjoy playing, um, adults enjoy playing, um, the, the uh, rituals and symbols from a Jungian perspective certainly appear to um, ma manifest the underlying process of individuation. Uh, it starts with opposites, it ends with union. At the end of each uh, major game, players will swap shirts, they'll in in intermingle with the crowd, they'll do the same, throw their shirts into the crowd. And it ends with the cup. Um, there's a union at the end. Um, and then there's a, 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 a renewal of the next season. So there's something going on there. But, but violence is um, part of it. I would say that personally, I would say that, the, 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 that there's a process going on of um, almost an alchemical process whereby the prima materia is brought in and goes through several processes of transformation um, towards this union and celebration of, at the end. And this is characterized, I think, in the, um, in the foundation laws of football. So uh, back in 1863 um, in London, there was a guy called Arthur Pemba, and uh, as they were uh, arguing, um, the various public schools and people interested in football about what football should be, um, he um, argued very strongly um, for what were called the Cambridge Rules, which was that um, you should not go and attack other people's shins. You should not be violent in the game. The game was about... Um, uh, good competitive sport, but not about violence. There was an opposing side, as you would expect. Uh, the result of these discussions um, was that the Cambridge rules or the um, the laws were uh, came down in in on the um, in favour of Pemba. So the rules, if you follow the rules, are pretty non-violent in soccer. Uh, which indicate that there was a, an understanding of it being a civilizing force. Um, if you look more closely at it, uh, Pember himself spent some time in the United States, and um, he uh, was all about union, about bringing together diversity, bringing together different interests, bringing together uh, people with opposite views, uh, and using ceremony to do that. And in fact, he was known in the UK and published in the US, actually, as a ritualist, bringing together um, uh, different church movements. Actually, it was the Catholic church movements and the Protestant church movements at that time. 
in a move in a movement called ritualism. So he well understood that ritual had its place to play in healing, transformation, and bringing people to a different level of awareness, bringing people out of the ordinary through the numinous to a different kind of experience, which was somehow transcendent. So that's really quite interesting. Now, if you move on to does football create violence or doesn't it? Um, well, there is some evidence to suggest that for um, countries where there are existing tensions, that um, qualification for the World Cup um, will lead to an increase in low level um, military uh, uh, conflict or military incidents, not war, but, but military I incidents. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, in fact, um, uh, it's very easy to um, whip up a football crowd or in a nation or a town um, into a state of um, aggression towards its neighbours. So if it's used politically in that way, of course, football can be an instrument of violence. It doesn't per se contribute to violence, but it can be used as such, and there are very clear occasions um, historically documented and written up in this book where yeah, that does happen. Um, however, at the same time, um, it can be used um, mindfully or just naturally as a means of healing and transformation and dealing with war trauma. And it, to that extent, it can be used to avoid the repetition of war trauma. The, the repetition of wars because of unresolved trauma, basically. And you can see this in the humour of the crowd chanting in, um, in, in, in some England versus Germany matches, for example, uh, where humorous anti-German um, slogans relating to the Second World War are chanted by uh, the English and the same are chanted back by the Germans. Um, all, uh, the majority of both supporters having a beer together afterwards and enjoying the game. Um, so there's some process of uh, dealing with and transforming unresolved trauma um, which goes on in these, in these situations. And what about the spectators? Are they there? Because Nada, you said something interesting in the beginning. You said, how can a ball attract so much libidinal force? And I'm wondering mm. what we're, what the crowd uh, is projecting onto these players. Are they carrying something for us? Well, I think that they are um, hero um, hero personalities. They are the the um, as you would say canvas for our projection of um, how do we execute our own inner movements and follow the self because in fairy tales we have this rolling spherical um, objects magical objects that a wise old man gives to the young hero least expected to become a hero and then at certain crossroads it will it will guide the way so i think that the uh, spiritus move is something that initiates movement and then should be followed is something that we are fighting for. It's actually a quest for meaning. And that is um, fascinating because that is our individuation process. That is why we are here in this dimension. And that is what our purpose is. So to, to find our path to reinvent it, to be reinvented. And it's a big uh, struggle and a big fight. So it is the matter, our matter of survival. And that is what is projected there. It is participation mystique, but it is held. It is a held ritual. And it's as meaningful as um, church mass or any other form of uh, sacred rituals. I think we project the meaning. And John, you mentioned rituals and symbols. And I was wondering if if you would say a little bit more about that uh, from a Jungian perspective, the rituals that are enacted in a game. Um, I, I can, Laura. I'd like to just preface it briefly with, um, I think, a, a pretty central point here. Um, that <clears throat> in order for that stage, for the football stage to work, you have to have good authority and you have to have play. 
And um, I was very moved um, by David Burston, my, my colleague's uh, comments and uh, information about um, his reflections on the Whitman school shooting in the United States and the discovery um, that violence in that way um, was somehow related to the lack of play, the lack of ability to play safely as a child. Mm. Hence the National Institute for Play being um, established. And this is incredibly important. Um, uh, uh, Fred Eng in his work in the <clears throat> on the American football side, um, terribly, terribly important work which shows that the um, that the, the treatment of children as young adults living out the fantasies of their parents um, is uh, really unhelpful mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and damaging. And if that happens at a, at a cultural level, um, it, it needs a counter force to um, help help civilization along. And to your point, a ritual is one of those ways of containing things, of explaining things, of of not explaining things, of, of, of bringing in a mystery, which enables people to enjoy the healing and transcendent moments of unity at a higher level of consciousness than they might come in with, or we, or I might come in with as a football um, fan, um, as the, the, the aim is to beat the opposite team. Well, that, it's a wonderful start to, to come in with that mm. kind of tribal loyalty. But it's a better finish to, um, in that process, to be admiring these wonderful moments of transcendence when uh, Pele gets the ball and dribbles through five players and passes the ball, passes it back, scores a goal. Transcendent moment, absolutely wonderful um, moments which we've all experienced in, in, in football and um, the, 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 the rituals um, and the boundaries really contain and enable those kind of that process of in, in individuation really it, it, at a cultural level it enables healing and individuation and what are the, what, what are the rituals and boundaries so people line up on opposite sides of a circle. That's interesting. That would be very interesting to see what that means. They put the ball on a center point of the circle. That's interesting, isn't it? There's uncertainty about who kicks off. That's dealt with by the to cost toss of a coin by the referee. Well, that's interesting. We could be really curious about what these mean. And we can do our own kind of investigation and our own amplification of these symbols. And they lead us into very, very interesting places, some of which I've mentioned in the book. But they're not, they're not, um, uh, they're, not per they're not only, they're personal and in very, very different ways. And um, they're collective in some ways, which we recognize. Um, there's the question of whether or not teams kneel at the beginning of the, uh, of the game. Now, there's a one minute silence if somebody has, uh, has died who is respected by the football club or the football community or is a national figure before the game. Then there are all the rituals and chants during the game. Um, something about the north ground, north side, something about the south side, something about the east side, something about the west side. Um, there's a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, 22 players on the ball. We never know what the outcome is going to be. It's a mystery to it. So how is that uncertainty principle working? What drives the result? What does it all mean? Uh, the, the game um, moves towards this idea of everybody pointing out that which is unfair. And um, um, the unwritten rule is that you always support your side in claiming that the other side has been unfair. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of collective psychosis, you know, which is most enjoyable. And, um, uh, but it's a game. And behind that, there's the realisation, if you like, that um, 
uh, the question of fairness and good authority is never certain. And it's something which is a continual struggle, both internally and, uh, and on a social level, that we all seek good authority. And when there's corruption in that good authority, when there's a, a, um, an obvious um, bias in the game, that's very, very concerning. Because then the whole system of uh, containment breaks down. So if a country, if a country um, is disconnected from the spirit of its uh, declarations and and uh, constitution, and that's reflected in the rules of the game in, in, on the pitch, you will see it. You will see what's happening on the political and social sphere on the pitch. There will be an increase in violence. There will be a uh, an increased uh, fragmentation um, of. Uh, society more people will get injured um, and it's all it can all be read in the in the microcosm of the football games at the time and there's an extensive study on this relating to the relationship between uh, the united kingdom uh, and the soviet union in 1945 uh, which was replayed out which was replayed in the symbolism of uh, the Moscow Dynamo tour to Great Britain. It's really interesting and, uh, and funny and would um, recommend that part of the book to, to listeners if they're interested in that particular topic. I would like to circle back to something that you mentioned about the unlived life of the parent and the, the burden that's placed on the child. So we've been talking about adult sports, and I'd like for you to comment more about that, about the parents of children players, mm. either of you. Well, I'll give a 30 second and then pass over to Nada. <clears throat> it also invites the question of transgenerational um, projection. What is being replayed? Um, down the generations, uh, from generation to generation, in matters of unresolved trauma on the football pitch. And what does that signify for wider society? So at that level, that's a really important question, and it's one in, for which football and the study of it offers very good diagnostic information. Um, I'll pass over to Neda. Neda? Did we lose Nada? Yeah, I'll I'll just um call. Hang on, just a second. Nada, Nada, we lost your sound. Come in. Um, hi there. Hello there. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, that was an interesting moment when we lost Nada's sound, and uh, a moment of reunion here because we're now both in the same room. Great. So unions might like to reflect on that. Uh, <laughs> that little inactive there. Can you hear me well now, Laura? Yes, I can hear you fine, Nada. Hi. Uh, I think that it is a key uh, source of frustration because it actually shows how uh, transgenerational trauma works that parents do not have enough capacity to live in present moment and be connected to the inner child and thus they can't see their real children um, so to say in this outside manifest reality and connect to them for what they really are and support their own uh, growth mm -hmm. and because they live in trauma dimension they relive their traumas and project the inner spectators, spectators of the trauma on children and it's replayed and we often see how children and young people and later on adults just continue with that internalized automatism of the trauma. And that's why uh, when you mentioned violence, and I'm very grateful for that, uh, Laura, because uh, prima materia, that violence is actually released on this liminal space, which is a stage for trauma to be witnessed. Mm. And... Um, if the good authority, which actually is the boundary and holding mechanism, is there, that violence maybe will turn into safe space and transform the prima materia in vitality for play. And Jung puts so much emphasis on play 
a soul making space mm. and human as well. Yeah. Play a soul making space. Yeah. Yeah. My last question is about the losing team. We've spoken about healing, but what is happening with the losers? Um, take 10 seconds and okay, then pass okay, on okay. to the yeah, Take your time. Um, so I think that it's a major um, chance for from participation mystique of all the actors of the ritual mm. to uh, give birth for some learning and uh, taking reflection point and separating, claiming certain libidinal energy for reflection, for creating new consciousness and learning from the experience rather than just being in this numinous ritualistic space. Because the ones who lose are in a way forced to reflect and look and analyze and maybe learn from it and then they go on the, on, on the other level. So, and it's also three times in fairy tales, it's the mastering the skills of the energy transformation process and fighting the opposites, if there is capacity for it. Excellent, excellent points. John, over to you. So, so what about the the losing team? What about the losing team? Well, the, the, I think the, um, that matters in the early stages of um, understanding football, I would say, it's about wins and losers. Um, But um, as, as, as it progresses, um, towards union, um, there's a realization that the uh, that the goal is not the goal. That the goal is to realize that the goal is not the goal, mm, mm-hmm. and that um, there's a very nice quote by Rudyard Kipling uh, uh, over the, the tennis court at, at Wimbledon. You know, which says that um, when you can look at triumph and disaster. Uh, and recognize them in, as uh, both of them as imposters, you know, then you mature. And so in terms of the energy transformation process, we can look at football as, if you like, a transform, uh, as, a, as a very good example of the, trans, the transcendent function dramatized. You've got opposite forces. There's a holding of the tension between them. And if that tension is held, something emerges. If you mistake, uh, a sort of temporary victory or something as uh, as a uh, in a grandiose or humiliating way a loss then that's okay but that's just part of the process for reflection of learning the the, the whole idea is about learning and the transformation of trauma and moving towards higher levels of civilization and consciousness um, I would like just to add to your wonderful question about the losing team, something that just occurred to me mm-hmm. as a potential rounding off, and it is from the archetypal perspective. So we amplified in the book who is playing um, the um, Popovu myth, which is really a one profoundly deep mystery of how our ancestors and ancestral themes, including traumas and gifts, live with us. In simultaneously in all these mysterious dimensions of life. And it is about two twins who lost their fathers in the underworld, who were outwitted in the football game with the lords of the underworld because they were not conscious enough and not ready. So the twins go, and it's a beautiful amplification of the ball motif, etc. And... Uh, they are ready. They know all the tricks that the lords of the underworld will play on them and kill them and keep them forever in the underworld. So the utmost trial, there are seven trials. What do they decide? They can beat them, but they decide to lose. They decide to lose the football game in order to gain something much more precious. Mm. And that is the knowledge of resurrection. And then they transform into new lights, they become sun, the sun and the moon. And um, I think if we look at the manifest symbol level of the game, it is that the utmost goal uh, and aim is to get the cup, which is like a holy grail, which is a womb for the new life to happen, which is really the peak 
the peak of each, every religion and myth, and that is the possibility of future and the psychological child of the soul. And, and so fi- final comments from me. Uh, uh, is that okay? Yes, please. Yeah, to final comments from me uh, is that um, I would say we really owe a great deal of um, thanks and uh, um, a feeling of being very, very um, impressed by the large number of trainers, football trainers who work with children, both here in in Serbia, many of them, uh, in America, many of them we've met and know, in the United Kingdom, which we met and know, and probably all around the world, but the young trainers, or trainers with a young attitude, um, who really appreciate that they are there to help children develop through this sport and to become better people. And I'd like to just finish with that with a word of thanks to Bill Beswick, who's just summarized it very simply. You know, what is football about? Well, I think it might help us become better people. I think that's great. And thank you, Laura, thank for, you, Laura. for inviting us to speak. Thank you both. Please visit the website Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. Speaking of Jung is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Amazon Music. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel, Jungian and Laura. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device, simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. Links to Amazon's new Echo devices can be found in the show notes. So with special thanks to Routledge, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.